with their corporals and we were a convoy of 18 miles long we had some tanks too and uh, it took us about three days to get to Angola and uh, we pulled in and then for the first week or so we uh, went through some drills and uh, we got prepared and then for the next two weeks we drove around Angola playing cat and mouse and we were told that we were up against a force of 25,000 we were 6,000 South African troops had been sent up from South Africa According to the Geneva Convention at that time, we weren't allowed to be in Angola. And so nobody knew we were there. From the time we were briefed, three weeks before that, all outside communication was cut off, no more phones, no more letters. Nobody knew where we were. And we were in Angola, it was as hot as blazes. 45 degrees in the shade, 110% humidity, boiling hot. And we were playing cat and mouse, driving around in mobile microwave ovens. It was intense. And uh, I remember, I had one cassette, those were the days you had a cassette, had two wheels in it, if you remember. And uh, I had one cassette, 10 songs, it was the U2, the Joshua Tree, and I had my Sony Walkman on. And what I'd done is I'd taken all my mortar cases and I'd packed them up so they were the same level as my bench. And I'd rolled out a blanket and I'd made myself a little bed and I lay back. And in those two weeks all I did was lie there and perspire as I listened to the same 10 songs, U2, over and over and over again. And one day the medic jumped up, hit his head on the top of the vehicle, and it was white as a sheet. I took my earphones off and I could hear the ricochet of bullets on the outside of the vehicle. We were under attack. Our logistics were off. So we had 20 mil cannons, and our tanks were about a mile to the left. And we ran into four Russian T-55 tanks. And they were buried in the ground. Only their turrets were above the ground. You couldn't see them until they were right on top of you. And they just took us out. In that first two minutes, our very first combat, and the vehicle on the left of us, the Charlie car, within seconds the doors opened, the troops jumped out, but in that vehicle my friend Andre Tom and Franz Mullerbeck, the driver and the gunner, were still there when a tank took them out and they disappeared in a puff of smoke. I tell myself to this day they never felt anything. And on the other side, our Alpha car, the anti-air gunner was sticking out the back, with a shrapnel hit the top of the vehicle, the front of his head and took the back of his head out. And I only found that out about 10 minutes later after we had retreated and a medic came running through the bush and he said, who's got O positive blood? I said, me. He said, follow me. And I followed him through the bush and running through thorn bushes. While we were running through the bush, I still had my patrol mortar and my rifle and uh, mortars going off. The MiG-27 flew overhead, dropped a bomb about 200 meters away, massive explosion. It was deafening, screaming going on, rifle fire. And a medic disappeared over this ridge and I got to the edge of this ridge and I descended into this massive crater in the ground which had been created by a 250 pound bomb drop, dropped by a jet earlier. And in the bottom of this crater there were six or seven soldiers being treated. One had lost his arm, one had lost his face, another had lost his leg. The medics all around them. The medic grabbed my arm, pulled up my sleeve, shoved a needle into my arm, 
and shoved the needle into the soldier who was lying on his back in front of me. I dropped to my knees and I began to wave the flies off his face. He had a beard that was matted with blood and there were hundreds of flies. Angola, thousands of flies every single day all over us, all the time. And as I waved the flies away from his face, I said, please God, don't die. Please don't die. And then I said, please God, get me home alive. And I looked closely and that was my friend in, the, in our car that was sticking out the back where the shrapnel went through the front of his head and took out the back of his head. He died three hours later. And then every other day for the next seven months, we were in combat. And I remember sometimes being behind a tree, waiting for an opportunity, opportunity to get out and use my mortar pipe, and just saying the same thing over and over again, please get me on my life, please get me on my life. And uh, after seven months of that, uh, having done what I did with my mortar pipe, my RPG-7, and you know, watching my friends die on the other side of me, some of my friends splattered all over me, I came home, and uh, I was for two weeks in a rehabilitation camp just outside of South Africa. And I can't remember anything about that rehabilitation camp. The only thing I remember is they gave us fresh socks and underpants for the first time in seven months. I wondered what that was about. And uh, we had a couple of conversations with psychologists and psychiatrists. I don't remember any of those conversations, but I just kept saying to myself all the time, you know, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm gonna be okay. I'm home alive, I made it. And then when I got home after my parade, after being my, having my medals pinned on my shoulder, I shook, on my, on my chest, I should say, and I shook the hand of General Magnus Milan, the general of the South African army at that time. He said, thank you for your service. Have a great life. That was it. I got on a train and I went back to South Africa, back to my home in Durban. And uh, my parents picked me up at the station. We drove home in silence, off the preliminary hellos, etc. And uh, I locked myself in my bedroom for the next six months and drank myself into the bottom of a bottle every single day. Because every day, every night I went to sleep, all I could see was what I had seen in Angola. I had these flashing images. And uh, I was suffering from post-traumatic stress at the time. I wasn't really aware of it. But having these nightmares every night, and uh, any time I went to sleep, I quickly found out that if I was unconscious, I wouldn't have any nightmares. So I became unconscious on a regular basis. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I had saved up lots of money while I was in the military as I was deployed all over the place. And every time I was deployed, I was, uh, had this danger pain. So I came home and had this bank account full of money. And I proceeded to drink my way through it. I already started smoking marijuana while I was in the force. And it was quite common in South Africa. But now I was smoking every day too. Because when I got high and when I drank, then I wouldn't have any nightmares. And I could forget, forget about what was going on in my head every day. Six months after I got home, I was very lucky. I look back now and I see it as divine inspiration or divine intervention. There's a great friend of mine who was walking down the road. I was walking down the road. We happened to be going to the same place at the same time. It was a liquor store. And uh, he turned to me. He said, hey, Alan, I haven't seen you for a while. Where have you been? I said, I've uh, been in the army for the last two years. And he said, uh, me too. Where were you? And I said, I've been all over the place. I was sworn to secrecy before we left to go to Angola. We weren't allowed to talk about where we were going and thereafter where we had been. And so I just said to him, I'd been all over the place. And he said, I've been... In Angola recently, well, I was flying in on a regular basis as a medevac and I was bringing home the dead and the wounded. It must have been intense out there. Can you imagine? I said, yeah, I was there on the front line. And he said, wow, that must have been horrific. I said, more than you can imagine, my friend. And he said, come on to my place. So we went up to his flat. He lived around the corner from my parents' flat. And uh, we walked into his little flat. I'll never remember. It was a small little one-bedroom flat. It was pretty untidy, books lying all over the place, notes lying all over the place, 84 pages, things stuck all over the wall, highlighted, etc. And we sat down and we had a beer and he said to me, he said, Alan, you need to take control of what's happening between your ears, your thought process, your psychology. I'd never heard the word psychology prior to that moment or never remembered hearing it prior to that moment. And I said, well, what is psychology? And he said, it's the way you think and the way you process things, it's how you relate the world around you to yourself. And he said, I can imagine what's going on inside your head on a daily basis right now. It's probably a dark place. And I said, yeah, it's terrible. Because I don't want to talk to anybody about it. I don't want to talk, tell anybody what I had seen. And plus, I had signed that letter that said I wasn't allowed to talk about it anyway. My father had been in the army. My uncles, my cousins. Two of my cousins flew for the RAF. My uncle was based in, out in Singapore for the RAF. So we all kind of knew about it as a men in our family. But I didn't, certainly didn't want to talk about it. And uh, when I came home, all I could think about was my friends that I'd left in Angola. The ones who never came home. And I kept asking myself, how come I'm alive? And they're not. 
And so he said to me, that's what you need to take care of. So I said, how do you do it? So he turned around, he picked up a book and he put a book in my hand and he said, read this book, this is a great place to start. And I looked at the book and it said, think and grow rich, Napoleon Hill. Anybody heard of this book? Raise your hand if you heard of this book. How many of you read this book? Raise your hand if you've read this book. Think and grow rich, Napoleon Hill. Think and grow rich. Now I looked at that book and on the cover of the book was a big pile of gold bullion. And above it it said, think and grow rich. I turned the cover over, the back cover, and I've read the back flap about the author Napoleon Hill and about the origins of the book. I said, it looks, it looks like a fantastic book. It was pretty thick. I hadn't looked at it, I didn't touch the book since, uh, since about the eighth grade at school. You know, I wasn't really an academic at school. I got an E for enough when I, when I left school. My father was uh, in, in greatest despair. He, I, I think I turned in great because uh, you know, he put me through two private schools. Never let me forget it. Uh, cost a fortune. That's all he ever worked for. It was for me to get a good education. I got an E for enough. And now I'm looking at the first book I've actually probably laid my hands on in about two years. And it's about this thick. And my friend, I, my friend says, I should read it. So I looked at him and he said, listen, I'm serious. He said, read this book as if the author is sitting opposite the table from you and talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. That's how much attention you want to pay to this book. He said, if you only ever read one book in your lifetime, this would be the book to read. So I heard him and I took it home and I read it three times, cover to cover over the next six weeks. I couldn't put it down. It was amazing. I began to ask myself, how come we don't teach this stuff at school? I came across two phrases in that book. The first one was, whatever the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. But it was the second phrase that really hit me hard, like a sucker punch to the stomach. Because when I read it for the first time, I refused to believe it. It said, every adversity has within it a seed of an equivalent or greater benefit. And when our brain read that for the first time, it said, bullshit. That's not true. Every adversity has within it a seed of an equivalent or greater benefit. That can't be true. I thought, how can that go to be beneficial to me in any way? You see, I'm not ashamed to tell you that for a long time I was a victim. I drank myself through every single day. I got high as often as I could. I was feeling sorry for myself. I was trying to cope with what I'd been through, what I'd seen, what I'd done. More importantly, what I'd done. Because I'd been to two Catholic schools. And although I'm not religious and have never been religious anyway, I had religious dogma shoved into my brain since the age of four. And now I'm 21 years of age and I'm trying to come to terms with the fact that I've killed hundreds of people. People that probably just were sucked into doing whatever they were asked to do. Because a lot of those people were led by Cubans. There was Russian influence at that time. Apparently they were trying to get into Nubia, or so we were told at the time. Couldn't bring propaganda, who knows. But the enemy force that we were fighting against were largely black from the neighboring, uh, uh, neighboring African countries who had only been told, according to our reconnaissance, they had been told that they were asked to do that job and they were getting, what, measly food and water for, to feed their families. That's how they were encouraged to do what they were doing. So every day I began to think about these things without even wanting to. They were just there all the time. So I numbed myself to that. But that book was a saving grace for me. Meeting Malcolm at that time was a divine intervention because what happened was I went to his place every day after that because it became my, my library. Because he had about 350 books in his flat and I read all of them over the next 18 months. And 18 months later, I got a letter from London. It was one of my best friends. He had arrived in London about six months prior to that. And he said, Alan, you've got to get to London. This place is amazing. I wrote back, I said, I'm on my way. I sold everything I had. I took all the money I had, I changed it into, uh, into sterling. I put some cash in my pocket and I had the rest in those traveler's checks that we used to have at that time. And I arrived in London with a backpack on my back and 800 quid in my pocket. And I checked into a BNB in North Kensington, <laughs> just down the road from the Grenfell Tower actually. And for the first six years I was in London, that was my community. I made a lot of friends there, fantastic neighborhood. Very sad to see what happened there recently. And, um, you know, I just uh, fell in love with London because I thought, wow, nobody knows me here. No one knows what I've done. It's awesome. And the very first thing I did two weeks after I arrived in London, I went looking for a book because I was hungry now for my next book. And I didn't arrive with a book. So I said, let me go to a bookshop. And I'm in Victoria. And I walk into Victoria Station. And I walk into a bookshop. And I'm walking around. And in those days, the self-help section was a tiny little corner on the far side of any bookshop. If you were in the self-help section, it was probably you were the only person there. Anyone else in that bookshop probably look over you and see you in the self-help section and say, oh, must be a weirdo. Self-help, right? This is 1990 I'm talking about. And I'm in the self-help corner and a book literally jumps off the shelf into my hands. I had that experience. It literally jumped into my hands and I'm sure it said, read me. 
And on the front cover it said unlimited power. And there was a faceless mannequin, just a head on the cover. Pretty futuristic cover. And I turned it over and there was a picture of a guy in the bottom left corner with big white teeth and a side parting and a pair of braces with a white shirt and a yellow tie. I'll never forget it. I've still got that book. And it had a big white teeth and he had a big smile like this. And it said, Anthony Robbins is America's number one peak performance coach. And he's coached all these people and he's a master of neuro-linguistic programming. And I thought, neuro-linguistic programming? What does that mean? This is 1990, no one had heard of NLP by that stage, you know, in those days. But now, I'm sure most of you have heard about, heard about NLP. And I thought, I'm going to buy this book. So I put the book out of my arm and I looked up. I said, what else can I get? And then I saw two audio cassettes on a rack of cassettes. Two caught my eye. One was Awaken the Giant Within, and the other one was Giant Steps, both read by the author, Anthony Robbins. I said, hey, it's the same guy. I grabbed those same tapes. And I listened to those tapes right through the 90s. Specifically one phrase in particular, this too shall pass. And every time throughout the 90s, which was often when I felt suicidal, and I felt I was at my wit's end and I was hanging on my fingernails, I would pull out that cassette and I would put that cassette in, push it down, press play. Remember you used to have like five buttons on those little cassettes with a little speaker on the top. I'd press play and I'd listen to that voice, this too shall pass. I'd rewind it and listen to it again, this too shall pass, this too shall pass, which is a bit of Buddhist philosophy actually, which means nothing is permanent, everything is up and down, you've got to ride the waves. And uh, I listened to that phrase, particularly at the toughest times when I was feeling suicidal, because at that particular time in my life, and I'm talking about now towards the end of the 90s, and by this stage, I'd read, I don't know, probably close to a thousand books at that time, and I'd been to so many workshops, and I discovered that I had a photographic memory. And I used to ask myself, where was this memory when I was 16 years at school, right? 16 years of age at school. But it was, it was only because of the subject. I was so, from the moment I laid my hands on thinking we were rich, I just fell in love with the subject. I thought, wow, this is amazing. I was fascinated by it. And uh, I'd been to workshop after workshop, and I'd gone to all the free talks I could get to in London. And then we used to go to St. James's Church in Piccadilly at that time, I remember, and we used to have a lot of free talks there. So I'd seen a lot of speakers, a lot of trainers, a lot of facilitators, and uh, towards the end of the 90s, I was now working at Credit Suisse. It was 1999, in fact. And it was a terrible Tuesday for me. Because on a terrible Tuesday meant that the previous four days I'd been out for four days, I'd been binging. By that stage, I had a terrible cocaine habit. I was suicidal. I was addicted to cocaine. I was working at Credit Suisse First Boston and Canary Wharf in IT. I was working 12 hours a day, 7 days a week, 84 hours a week. I took every day of overtime before it even came up on the calendar. I just told my boss, put my name down. Any overtime, I'll have it. I worked all the time. And uh, I was suicidal and I was sleeping on my friend's couch. I was making £25 an hour at that time. Not bad for an E student. Uh, considering I have no IT experience, I just blagged my way into that job and made myself <laughs> indispensable. And, uh, but I was making 25 pound an hour and I was making about five and a half grand a week. It's pretty good money. But I was 65 grand in debt, sleeping on my friend's couch and I was suicidal and empty, broken in every sense of the word. And I used to lie on my friend's couch in Acton and I would think about going down to Acton Town train station and walking onto the track, very easy to do, the boom was always up. And I always think about going walking all the way up the track so I could catch the train while it was moving very quickly. It would be over fast. I wouldn't feel a thing, no one would miss me. That's what I used to tell myself. Then I'd pull out the cassette play, tape, put it in, listen to Tony say, this too shall pass. It's my best, you know, my best imitation of his voice. And uh, that was my life, really. 12 hours a day, seven days a week, four nights a week, I would go out and binge, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday night I would crash, Tuesday I would arrive at work, seven o'clock in the morning, and I would be, it would be a terrible Tuesday because I was coming down hard, and one day I was looking at the paper, and I opened the paper, and there was an advert for Anthony Robbins. How many of you heard of Tony Robbins, this guy, this big six foot eight American guy with the big white teeth? Anyone heard of him? And not, who hasn't heard of him? Anybody hasn't heard of him? Anybody here not going to move their arm no matter, no matter what I say? <laughs> so, Tony's this big guy, right? This six foot eight American guy, I've been listening to his voice and I've really fallen in love with his voice, saved me, as I said many times, from going to do the unimaginable. And uh, I see this advert on a Tuesday morning and it says, Unleash the power within. And for the previous 11 years, since the moment I laid my hands on Think and Grow Rich, it had been 11 years by that stage, 88, now it was 99, almost to the day actually, 
that I first read thinking, oh, Richard, I see this ad and I think, hey, I've got to get to this workshop. I've been listening to this guy's voice for just about nine years now, reading the book. I've read, since then, I've read Awaken the Giant within his second book and his third book, Notes to a Friend, which is a much smaller book. And I thought, I've got to get to this workshop, but it's going to cost me 800 quid, and I don't have that. And as I was thinking about how I could pay for it, the door opened behind me and in walked my colleague, Dan. I said, Dan, great to see you. Come over here, my friend. I put my arm around him. I said, can you help me to get to this workshop? It's going to cost me 800 quid. Can I borrow it from you, please? He looked at me like I was insane, and he said, what do you mean? You owe me 1,000 quid already. Now you want me to pay for this workshop? It's 800 quid. And he says, what is this workshop anyway? Unleash the power within. What's that? Who's this guy? This was a picture of Tony Robbins with his hands out like this. And I said, this guy is America's number one peak performance coach. Apparently, the, the world's number one peak performance coach. He's coached, you know, President Bush, Nelson Mandela, Princess Di, Gorbachev, Andre Agassi, Greg Norman, you name it. This guy is the best of the best. And I need to go and see him. Because he's, I believe, is the only one who can save me and help me to turn my life around because I need some help. And my friend looked at me and he said, what do you mean you need help? And I told him. For the first time, I told any human being at that point in my life what kind of state my life was in. 65 grand in debt, suicidal, using cocaine just to get through the day, binging four days a week, working 84 hours a week and hating my life, hating the person I saw in the mirror. I wasn't even aware at the time why I was like that and how I got to that point in my life. I just knew that I hated it. It reminded me of what Winston Churchill used to say, if you're going through hell, keep going. I had settled in hell. That's what it felt like to me. So he looked at me and he bought me a ticket on the spot. We got on the phone. There was no email addresses in those days, no websites. We got on a phone number, he phoned, and he bought me a ticket on his credit card. And about six weeks later, I arrived at that workshop. And I remember on the Friday, being in that environment, there was about 1,500 people there. It was in Cardiff, Wales. I rode down there on my motorcycle. I didn't even have the money for a hotel. So what I did was about four days before the workshop, I phoned my ex-girlfriend and I said, listen, you need to come to this workshop with me. She was a psychologist too, and uh, she was working in the corporate environment. And I said, do you need to come to this workshop with me? Because you're going to love this. You're a psychologist. I'm going to see this guy, Tony Robbins. Have you heard of him? She said, yeah, I have actually. So I said, I'm going to Cardiff. Why don't you come with me? And she said, I don't know. It's a good idea. So I said, yeah, you're going to love it. And I enrolled her in the idea. And my intention and my motivation for that was because I knew that she would get a hotel and I could sleep on the floor in a hotel room if she let me, which is what happened actually. I slept in her hotel room because I had nowhere else to stay. And I enrolled her in that idea too. And she came down to the workshop. I remember sitting on the Friday amongst 1,500 people. And Tony came onto the stage and I knew I was in the right place at the right time. And I was ready to make a change. I didn't know what kind of change I wanted to make at that time. And it was only on the third day that it became apparent to me. Because on the third day of this workshop, it was very intense three days in. And I'm loving every single minute of it. I'm thanking my friend in my mind over and over. Saying thank you for helping me to get you. And on the third day I get the microphone in my hand. And I start talking to Tony. I say, listen, Tony, I've been listening to you for nine years on cassette tape. I've been read your books. I said, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for coming to the UK. It was the third time he came to the UK at that stage. He came in 93. I knew he came. I wasn't ready. I was living in London, but I was burning the candle at both ends. He came in 96 again. I was still burning that candle at both ends. I still wasn't ready. And now he was there for the third time. And I began to tell him how much I loved him and I loved his work and how much his voice had saved me. And especially that, that one phrase, this too shall pass. And he began to question me, and he's a very clever man. There's a movie that's on Netflix. How many of you use Netflix here? Anyone got Netflix? I encourage you to go onto Netflix and find, and, and find the movie, I'm Not Your Guru. It's Tony Robbins. It's a six-day workshop called Date With Destiny, and the movie has been compressed into 90 minutes of what takes place in that room over six days. Phenomenal program. And uh, when you watch that movie, you'll see how Tony is very, very clever at helping people turn around very quickly often within 30 to 40 to 50 to 65 minutes, you know, very, very quick. And he got in my head. And before I knew it, I was sharing about my military experience in front of 1,500 people and what happened to me in Angola. I never knew it was going to happen. It just came out and it was like a boil erupting. There was a moment I caught a glimpse of my own face on the screen in front of 1,500 people. I said, my God, I look terrible because I was crying. It's not coming out of my nose. And I think everyone was crying. And Tony was crying. And he got off the stage and he came walking towards me. And I climbed out from the chairs and I ran down the aisle towards him and I took off about three feet away. And he caught me and I wrapped myself around him like a monkey. I mean, the guy's six foot eight, man. Right? And he held me and eventually I got down to my feet and he grabbed my head and he looked down into my eyes and I'll never forget it. 
It was like he poured love into my house. It was in, just incredible. And he said to me, he said, hey, everybody deserves a second chance. He said, you've got to stop beating yourself up. You've got to forgive yourself. He said, take the lesson from the past. And then he said, use it. Use it to make a difference. Use it to serve other people. He said, you used to serve, and now it's time to start serving again in a different capacity. He said, everyone deserves a magnificent life. This is your chance to do that. And he said, now I'm going to let, I want to turn you around now. And he said, I want you to let these people love you because you haven't loved yourself for a long time. And without even thinking about what he said, I couldn't even, before I even thought about what he said, he spun me around and there were 1,500 people on their feet. And the love hit me like a truck and I nearly fell over. And I dropped to my knees in front of him and I sobbed like a baby. And I felt this release, this deep, powerful emotional release. And I got up, I walked back to my seat. And in that, dis in that moment, I made a decision that I was going to study everything that Tony had to teach. Every course he had, every program he was selling, I was going to buy it. And I got that moment later that day and I went to the back of the room and I signed up for three programs that were going to be delivered in America. Two of them in America and one in London over the course of the next year, which was going to cost me 10 grand. And while I filled the form and signed the, the, the document, my brain was saying, are you mad? How are you going to find 10 grand? You have to borrow 800 quid to get you. And now you're going to find 10 grand? Where are you going to get it from? And I just said to myself, I said, I'm going to find a way. I'm going to find a way. This work is too important. I want to take this work back to South Africa. You see, I had quite a few friends that committed suicide in my life. Only two of them through, through the military experience they had with me in Angola. The others, for other reasons. But I knew that there were lots of people in South Africa who were suffering. I've got a lot of my friends who are in the military still, in terms of, uh, you know, in, in, uh, around the world, here in England too. Uh, I've got some of my friends who are now working uh, as uh, freelancers in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I've got a lot of my friends in the police force still to this day. And I knew a lot of people were hurting. Not only them, other people too, their families. And uh, so I thought, I've got to study this work. And I've got to find a way to make it happen. And so what I did, I did. I found a way to make it happen. And I studied everything he had to teach. 18 years later now, I've been in that environment for 18 years. I've just come back from, from Amsterdam, as, as Dale said, where I spent the previous five days, the last five days with Tony and 1,300 people there. And we were focusing on business, business mastery. But in the last 18 years... I've traveled the world with Tony and I helped to facilitate the workshops. I've been speaking internationally for 16 years and I've been coaching people. I've been doing interventions with military personnel, police personnel. I've done interventions with women who have been raped in South Africa. I've done interventions with people who have watched their families get murdered right in front of them in South Africa. And I've been doing that for 16 years. And the only reason I could be doing that right now, the only reason I get, I get to do what I do right now, and my life is amazing. I'm, I'm blessed. I mean, every morning I wake up and the first thing I say is, good morning, good morning. It's great to be alive. Today is my favorite day. Thank you, I'm blessed. I say it every day. I've been missed a day for 18 years. I've been saying that every morning out loud, 18 years. One of the great things I got from the military was routine and discipline. I'm grateful for that. But I say that every day because uh, I know that how important it is to prime myself. And I get to do this great work and travel the world and help people to change their lives. And I'm here to, uh, the reason I'm here to share my story is because they all thought it would be a good idea. And I, and, you know, I love sharing my story. And uh, I'm here to, to, to remind you of a few very important fundamental basics. First of all, your mind is designed to keep you safe. When I say your mind, I mean the mind. Your brain and the mind is designed to keep you safe. You've got a brain that's 2 million years old. That's the problem. We have a brain that's 2 million years old and it's designed to notice what's dangerous and keep you safe. And anytime you see anything, your brain immediately asks two questions in a nanosecond. What do I do? What should I focus on? First of all, it's about the focus. What do I focus on? What does this mean? What should I do? It's really three questions. What to focus on, that happens automatically. But the two questions that come here after is, what does this mean and what do I do? And unfortunately, we live in a society right now where we are training our youngsters, especially our youngsters, like I'm talking youngsters, like my son, 15, my daughter who's about to be 13. Uh, and, you know, we're training our youngsters now, uh, in a, we're training them to be dysfunctional when they become adults. So, you know, if I look at my life and I look at my experiences and I look at that sentence, every adversity has within the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit. I'm so pleased that I went to Angola when I look back now. For many years, I hated it. I cursed everything. I cursed the person I saw in the mirror, I cursed God, I cursed my life. And as I said, I was suicidal for many times in my life, in long periods, depressed, <coughs> a drug addict, homeless, financially broke. I've been on the verge of bankruptcy twice. I've been a millionaire once and lost it all. 
I'm divorced. So I've been through a lot of painful experiences, but I look back at two very powerful experiences in my life. Going to war and losing everything when I, when, I, when I finally got to the top of my mountain and lost everything thereafter, including a divorce and lost my kids. Well, that was my outlook at that time. I've managed to heal those, exper- those, those relationships, but those two experiences, going to Angola and losing everything were the greatest gifts I ever had because I've since been able to turn my worst days into my best days. And this kind of work allows you to do that. When you, get, when you start to study the mind and the brain and how it works and you start really studying psychology, human behavior, and you use tools like NLP, emotional freedom technique, and you start to really study what goes on between your ears all day long. How you think, what you think about, what you're focusing on. What causes you to focus on specific things? Why do you focus on specific things? Every single one of us focuses on different things because of the way we've brought up, because of the belief system we are fed when we we're young, because of the values that we collected through our youth because of the people we modeled, our parents initially, and our parents initially is where our first psychic wound comes from. So all of these play a role. But when you can look back and turn your worst days into your best days, like I looked back at Angola for a long time and I said, why me? And then I began to say, how can I use it? What can I learn from it? How can I use it? How can I use it to serve other people? And I'm so glad I went there because I would never have been able to do all the work I've done over the last 16 years with the people I've done it with and help to change lives in the way I have. Without that. Without that. Yeah, when our second gift, that, you know, when I lost everything, I thought, wow, I had to learn all over again, go back to the basics, and know what is the real reason. See, I used to think money would make me happy. And then I made a lot of money. I went back to South Africa four years after I arrived at that Cardiff workshop. And I arrived in the state I arrived in, you can remember, four years later I was now in South Africa and I was standing in front of the Sharks rugby team. Any rugby fans here? Standing in front of the Sharks rugby team, there was about 25 players in that team at that time. Butch James, John Smith, Albert van der Berg, Dion Carstens. You know, the best players in the world. Champions. Twice. And I'm standing in front of them to tell Sharks, and I'm teaching them what I learned from Tony over the previous years. And I remember pitching myself, you know, in my mind, and I was having two conversations. I think, oh my God, it's the Sharks! Oh my God, look, look it's, it's Butch James, and it's John Smith, and... That was what's happening in my head, but the, on, the, on the outside I was cool, right? I was calm, I was teaching them, you know, about what was happening on the, in, in their brain while they were on the field, especially when they went behind. And, and I was teaching them about, you know, the small little nuances and the, the little things that happen in your brain and how it affects your behavior and how it affects what you focus on and it affects what you make it mean and it affects what you do. And I remember when I started working with them at the beginning of that season, they were at the bottom of the table. And at the end of that season, they were at the top of the table and they lost the Curry Cup final, which is the equivalent of the FA Cup final. They lost it in the final. They lost that final to the, Bull, the Blue Bulls. And they only lost that because they didn't prep. They got cocky. And they didn't prepare, prep, prepare themselves in the change room before they ran onto the field. And uh, amazing experience. But I would never have had that kind of experience if I had not gone and done that work. And I think, you know, also, the reason I want to tell you this, or the reason I'm sharing this with you, is because I've been thinking long and hard about what I could share with you here today. I can tell you right now that I've been speaking for 16 years, and I haven't been nervous for a long time. But being, knowing that I was going to come and stand in front of you, my fellow vets, and uh, you know, stand and share my story, I've been thinking, you know, it's been pretty nerve-wracking. And uh, I just wanted to share this, this small snippet of my life, this insight into my life, because I can tell you right now, How many of you here are already working with people and helping them to turn their life around in their transition from the military to civilian life? Raise your hand please, I can see. Awesome. How many of you, uh, although you're not doing it in in a professional capacity, but you still have that kind of impact in maybe a a home capacity at home, amongst your family, etc. Cool. So, uh, you know, what I would encourage you to do is you want to find out what's going on inside your brain on a daily basis. So in other words, three questions. What do you focus on regularly? What do you make it mean? And what does it cause you to do? How does it impact your behavior? Because I can tell you right now, in your upbringing, in all your experiences, especially the toughest experiences in your life, and especially my military friends, my veteran friends who have been through tough experiences and seen things that you wouldn't wish on any other person and done things you wouldn't wish on any other person, you know, that's going to affect you at some level. You know, I'll never forget when we were briefed at 0700 hours, all those months back, when I was sitting in, when I was standing on that parade ground, and I remember how people responded. I remember some guy said, wow, this is what I've been waiting for. This is what I've been training for. Those are usually the guys who were the scared, the, the most scared when we got into battle. Some people freaked out. Some people didn't even 
leave the base because they got so freaked out they couldn't leave. They left them behind. But everyone responds differently to every situation. I tell people that everything is always on the way. Nothing is ever in the way. But I've had to learn that over years and years and years and years of work. I've been healing myself for since 1988 when I first read, started really thinking about rich. And I've been peeling an onion every day and it never stops. And I can tell you right now, you know, I'm definitely no saint. I'm definitely, I haven't got it all worked out yet. I'm not perfect in any way. I still have dark days. I still have days, some days I don't want to get out of bed. But I just, what I do is I'm lucky because I've got the tools and I can pull out, I can reach into my toolbox, pull out a tool and I can use that tool and immediately turn myself around. Immediately. It used to take a long time, but now I can do it in seconds. But that comes from practice, 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 practice. If you want to be more effective as a facilitator or somebody who's creating change or working in helping vets to transition from military life to civilian life, then you've got to have a great coach, you've got to have a great mentor, you've got to have a great teacher. I would encourage every single person in this room to study Tony's work. Either online, on YouTube, or you know, follow him on Instagram, read his stuff, read his books. He's written five books, all of them bestsellers. He is the best facilitator on the planet in helping people to turn their life around. I can tell you right now, I've got lots of amazing friends who are veterans, and Ameri American veterans, uh, you know, Israeli veterans, European veterans, English veterans, special forces, all kinds of commandos, right, who are in that Robbins environment, who have come into that environment feeling like I felt in 1999, broken. Physically broken, spiritually broken, emotionally broken. And every single person I've met in that environment, every veteran in that environment is on the track, on the fast track to healing their life. And they have access to tools that most other people never even hear of. You know, I, I really, you know, I was listening to the, some of the presentations that, you know, obviously got you late, but I wish I could have been here all day to hear all of the presentations. But what I did here, and I really understand the kind of work you're doing, you know, especially at the government level. However, I don't think government does enough because they don't have the right tools. And if you don't have the right tools, you can't do enough. You're not even in the know. There's what you know that you know, and there's what you don't know that you don't know. And if you don't know what you don't know, you can't affect change at the highest level possible. And I tell you right now, if you want to really affect change at the highest level possible and help you to transition quickly, and especially in an emotional aspect, especially those vets who have been wounded, not only physically, but emotionally, that's far more painful emotionally, spiritually. You know, you can learn to live. Uh, and, I, and I say that, with the deepest sympathy and I know because I've got friends who are missing arms and missing legs and I know that physically they've come to the point where they can actually they've learned to live with that physical you know they, they, the fact that they, they have a, a one arm missing or two legs missing but it's, it's what's happening up here on a daily basis that they really have to work on hard they have to really 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 have to go to work daily discipline daily discipline and so you need the right tools you need the right structure you need the right you know the right knowledge and you've got to be the right place the right person in the right place at the right time. And everyone arrives at that place in their own time. But I'm here to share, as I said, to share a little bit of my story, but also to encourage you if you ever get the chance and you will get lots of opportunity. And it's not only because I'm a trainer for Tony, because I'm one of his top trainers now and there's only 60 of us worldwide that are, are, tra are Tony trainers. That's, and that's 60 people who have arrived at that level in the last 40 years, which is how long Tony's been teaching this stuff, 40 years. And I've watched Tony Robbins do interventions on... You know, special forces commanders who have been in the forces for 25 years, who have seen things that most people, you know, that, are, that they'll only ever see in Hollywood. You know, and, uh, you know, they, they, they don't even want to talk about stuff like that. And I've seen him turn those people around in the space of 90 minutes, where suddenly they've got a new, compelling future. That's what we need to give our veterans, a compelling future. Unfortunately, none of them have a compelling future. When I say none of them, I mean the majority of them. They don't have a compelling future. How difficult is it for a veteran who's seen something terrible, watch his friends die in his arms, to come home and have a compelling future, a future where they are excited to live into that, when they don't have the right tools, when they don't have the right supportive environment, when they don't have the right peer group. The gentleman who spoke earlier, I spoke about the right peer group. So important, have people around you who have access to those tools, who can guide you and lead you and champion you and support you. There's not enough of those kinds of peer groups. So, you know, life is... Uh, a never-ending journey. You know, and as I said, I started the thing off and I said, no, every adversity has within the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit. I firmly believe that now. I always tell people everything's always on the way. Nothing's ever in the way. The toughest thing about life is when we encounter painful experiences, significant emotional events, going to war, losing a loved one,
facing cancer, any of these events, but especially if we're talking military now, that one of the toughest things to do is to turn that into a positive. But it is possible. Because if you come to believe the phrase that nothing is ever in the way, everything is always on the way, that simply means that your darkest days will make you stronger if you allow them to. As they say, nothing, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But it's about having the willingness to turn that around and getting your hands on the right tools. So, you know, if you ever want to get the chance to see Tony, you should come and see him next April. He arrives back here in the UK on the 19th to the 22nd of April. You will absolutely love it. It'll be the best investment you ever made. The best investment I certainly ever made. Is to get to show up in that environment on a regular basis and help people to really change their life. Not only in that environment, but everywhere else I go. And the only reason I could have done that is because I was eager to get my hands on those tools. But they saved me so many, so many times. So, uh, I'm not sure how much time I have left. I've got two minutes, yes? So, uh, I suppose uh, two minutes, what can I leave you with? I want to leave you with one of my greatest quotes from Pablo Picasso. Whatever you can imagine is already real. Thanks for listening. Thank you.